Good evening and welcome uh, to this uh, European Law Institute uh, seminar. Uh, I, I, I am one of the vice presidents of the European Law Institute and am substituting for Professor Christian Wenderhorst, who unfortunately is unable to be present tonight. This is a, a subject of great interest and great importance. There is now, I think, across much of the world, quite a good regime uh, for surrender or extradition. But what is much more difficult is to work out what is the better place for the trial where there is a conflict of interest. Traditionally, states would have had quite restrictive rules on jurisdiction. Sometimes, like in the UK, um, you had a rule that required uh, you to commit the crime within the country, or sometimes there were some exceptions. But today, many states have moved to much more expansive jurisdictions. And what has also happened is that crime has changed. And so much of it is transnational. And I need not explain that because of the, the, it is so obvious in the case, for example, of, in, of crimes involving child pornography on the internet or cyber crimes and, and international uh, uh, financial scandals. And so a proper mechanism uh, for the settlement of conflicts of jurisdiction, taking into account the interests of it securing a proper conviction and also fairness is a matter of great importance. And on this area, much progress is needed. And that's why the European Law Institute was so grateful to those who took on uh, the project of looking at a regime for the prevention and settlement of conflicts of the exercise of jurisdiction in criminal law. I will say no more. Uh, but introduce uh, Professor Andre Klipp, Professor of Criminal Law, Criminal Procedure and Transnational Aspects of Law at Maastricht University. He's a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is also a judge in the Criminal Division of the Court of Appeal, and a member of the Board of Directors of the International Association of Penal Lawyers. He's an ex as I know him quite well, he's an exceptionally well qualified uh, criminal uh, academic, a and it's a real pleasure, as he was one of the prime movers of this project, to have him explain to you the background and how it fits together. Professor Clip. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Thomas, for your kind words of uh, introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here with you and uh, uh, to say a few words on the, the, the topic just intro introduced. Uh, and I will do that uh, uh, also with the assistance of uh, uh, a, a PowerPoint presentation, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, 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 hopefully at this moment uh, uh, visible to you. Um, and um, I will first address uh, uh, a couple of issues on jurisdiction what is jurisdiction? What is the problem of overlapping jurisdiction? And I will then present one of the three models that we have developed within the European Law Institute, uh, the model of allocation of jurisdiction. Uh, and then I will pass on to Gavin Robertson, who will present the two other models of the uh, uh, legislative proposal that the uh, uh, European Law Institute developed, the horizontal and the vertical model. The first issue is what is exactly jurisdiction? Well, jurisdiction is the power, well, you can describe it as the power and competence of a state to apply its substantive criminal law on conduct by human beings. And the main principle, this principle that all states in the world have is the principle of territoriality. But there are other principles as well. The principle of extraterritorial jurisdiction based on the nationality of the perpetrator or the nationality of the victim or the very fact that the interests of a state are affected. The moment states apply their jurisdiction over crimes outside their territory, 
there is a fair chance of overlapping jurisdiction. In the context of the European Union, one can say that overlapping jurisdiction is homemade because in each legal instrument of the European Union, criminalizing certain conduct, member states are requested to create jurisdiction outside their territory. And here we see a rather contradictory approach. On the one hand, member states, but also Council of Europe member, member states, and within the United Nations context, states are encouraged to extend their jurisdiction. On the other hand, once they have jurisdiction, they often regard it as their own property. Whereas substantive criminal law uh, can be applied with full freedom, that is not a case for anything relating to enforcing the law and to investigate. You cannot simply send your police to go to another state and do the investigation. International law is very clear on that. There's a total prohibition to do so. European law is silent on the matter. This results in a situation that multiple offenses uh, have, are faced with a situation in which two or even more states have jurisdiction. And that means that two or more states may start an investigation, may bring a case before the court. And we also have to take into consideration that some states do not even need the presence of the accused to start up a court proceedings. So we may even see cases in which an accused uh, stands trial in a state without even knowing it. Concurrent pr uh, uh, prosecutions may take place with all the consequences it has with regard to the rates of the individual, but also to the resources that are double spent. We may also see Another situation that is inactivity of a jurisdiction state, and especially the very fact that there, are, that there is overlapping jurisdiction may lead to a state having jurisdiction not to engage any investigation because that state may say, I rather see the other state that is also competent to do the job. And then last but not least, there is a fear and it is a fear that exists, exact, especially exists among politicians, that no state has jurisdiction. Uh, that uh, at a certain moment, uh, uh, a offense has been committed and no state has jurisdiction. This is one of the main reasons that states uh, extend their jurisdiction and create further overlapping jurisdiction. So we see a couple of things emerging. One is a problematic ownership of jurisdiction. There is the implicit and more narcissistic uh, 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 notion that once you have jurisdiction, it's yours, uh, and that other states have no say in it. Um, there is not yet an understanding that crime is a common problem of which it is less important who does the job than that the job is done. Uh, and there is the disbalance uh, between the extraterritorial uh, territorial application of substantive criminal law and the inapplicability of in investigatory powers uh, also uh, uh, in extraterritorial matters. So here is the reason for the European Law Institute to analyze the problem and to see whether we can come to a new uh, 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 scheduling, a new ordering uh, of this situation. And this is what was quite a challenge because we also looked at earlier attempts that were made and the most advanced was a proposal by the Council of Europe already dating from 1990, so more than 30 years ago, in which the Council of Europe uh, presented a kind of priority list of reasons, uh, uh, connecting points for, uh, on the basis of which a decision could be made to uh, uh, give one state priority 
over another state. Um, in our proposal, we try to help and to advance the development of law by creating three different models, three different models uh, that also may uh, uh, lead to different options for states to apply. The most advanced and the most drastic model is the model that I will present to you. Drastic to a certain extent because it limits jurisdiction. Uh, on the other hand, it is it goes back to the origins of criminal jurisdictions and the origins of ju criminal jurisdictions are territorial. All states in the world apply the same basis of jurisdiction as a starting point, and that is that they are competent on their territory. Well, within the area, and that is the, 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 the key paragraph in this allocation model, within the area of freedom, security, and justice, each member state shall only exercise jurisdiction in respect of offenses committed in its own territory as determined by national law. So what the proposal does here is not to change national law, but to accept national law as the basis for jurisdiction, uh, ruling out any other principle of extraterritorial jurisdiction that such a state may have within the area of freedom, security, and justice. So in other words, if a French citizen kills a Spanish citizen in Portugal, it is Portugal that has jurisdiction and not France because of the active nationality principle and not Spain because of the, the, the passive nationality principle. And Portugal determines the jurisdiction that immediately rules out the, uh, uh, um, the application of other jurisdictions and also rules out investigatory power spent uh, uh, on a case that is most likely to be more successful in Portugal than it is in any of the other states involved. This is the general rule that this allocation model proposes. However, I presented a very simple case, a simple case of an offense uh, for which the location is very easy to be determined. Easy to be determined because the killing will take place on the streets of Lisbon. So it's located there and it cannot be disputed that it was in Lisbon. However, criminal offenses do not stick to the wishes of the drafters of rules. And we have two other uh, varieties that we must take into consideration. One is the offense that through its nature affects more than one territory. This relates to all the trafficking offenses, the trafficking of drugs, the trafficking of weapons, the trafficking of human beings, all these kinds of offenses that go from one state to another uh, and are in essence the continuation of the same offense. The constitutive acts are committed over the territory of two or, or more uh, uh, member states. And the other type of offense that may also exist and also creates uh, difficulties with regard to the application of a territoriality principle are the offenses that are very difficult to localize where where is an offense that takes place in the cyberspace committed? Where is it? Where is the location? Is it the location where the server of the computer is? Is the location of the recipient of the computer system that has been damaged? Or is it the, uh, 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 the state in which the perpetrator uh, uh, started its, uh, his, his actions? Well, also for those offenses, we say we must give an answer. These defenses do not immediately fall under the main territoriality principle of Article 4. So for those, we 
force. We asked the member states concerned to make a decision to allocate and to make a decision to allocate uh, uh, and therefore consult with each other in order to prevent that two proceedings take place at the same time. That is the main objective of the proposal, prevent the prevention and the solution of potential conflicts. So this consultation procedure is there for those uh, uh, offences uh, that do not have one location only. And here, uh, uh, it is several uh, criteria play a role that uh, uh, determine that uh, uh, state. The allocation, and that is very uh, uh, important, the allocation is binding upon all member states. So that would rule out further uh, uh, complications uh, uh, with regard to uh, uh, which state is competent. Um, I briefly refer to the criteria that we have formulated in Article 6, Paragraph 3. I say we, but if you read this paragraph and you, if you, you see the criteria, uh, 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 for instance, the, well, where we would take in the, into account where the majority of criminal activity took place, those that uh, have knowledge of competition law know how important this criterion is in allocating the competence in competition law. So in other words, we have adopted a uh, criterion that is already in practice uh, in the context of uh, uh, competition law. And last but not least, I will refer to the so-called rollback clause, because it may be so that a member state that uh, uh, um, has not been allocated uh, uh, will start a prosecution once uh, it is clear that the state that has been allocated to exercise does not finally dispose of the case. In other words, we try to have a fallback option in a situation that a member state will not be able to, uh, uh, to do the case. This is a safety course to, uh, to avoid impunity uh, and to ensure that in any case, a final disposal uh, uh, will be there. And with that, also with regard to the time, I'm happy to pass on to Gavin Robinson to present the two other models, the vertical and the horizontal model. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor André Kip, for such an excellent description of one solution. And um, we're now going to turn to Professor uh, Gavin Robinson, uh, who is a member of the project team, to hear a little bit more about the Ely project. He uh, <coughs> is now at the Wilhelm Pomper Institute for Criminal Law and Criminology and the Utrecht Center for Regulation Enforcement at Europe um, at Utrecht University having taken his uh, doc doctorate at the University of Luxembourg and having researched both in, in the University of Luxembourg and at the University uh, of uh, Surrey in the UK. Professor Robinson. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you very much, André, for, uh, for setting me up to talk about the, uh, the two of the three models that we put forward, I say, we as the working team back in 2017. Um, and then this was followed up back when the Eli instrument was incorporated into a volume um, released to Oxford University Press at the end of 2018. Um, I say we have three models, um, the other two being the horizontal model and the vertical model. And the terminology here is um, perhaps a little bit um, confusing um, because we often speak in the instrument of of a horizontal mechanism, which is incorporated within the model and a vertical mechanism for the prevention and resolution of conflicts of jurisdiction, criminal law, which is then incorporated into our model, if you like, model legislation. And why, the, why do these labels matter? Well, first of all, just to give you an idea of um, what do we mean by the horizontal uh, label attached to, to the horizontal model? Well, in the horizontal uh, 
model, the, uh, it's the member states, the, the NCAs, the national competent authorities, judicial authorities, which remain uh, or stay yeah, in the box seat. Uh, but the label, this is one of the dangers, perhaps the, one of the perils of choosing one word for a label. Um, it does not tell the whole story because even in, within the horizontal model, uh, the procedure for the um, resolution and prevention, depending on the aspects chosen, of conflicts of jurisdiction and the factors on which the decision will be based uh, between the member states, again, uh, are defined by EU law. So in this sense, one could reflect on this being, um, let's say, decided and then um, imposed vertically via EU law. It's another way to look at the horizontal model but it is overwhelmingly horizontal um, in the end. The vertical label, it's clear why the vertical model is called as such, because, but it, what's not, not immediately clear from the label is that the vertical model is superimposed onto the horizontal basis. So the member states remain um, in charge of, and, and in charge with, obligated to find a, an agreement, a solution. Um, but then if, if the consultations fail, the, a supranational decision, a binding decision can come from the Eurojust. Um, as you can see in the ELI instrument, these are what we call the regulatory uh, approaches, horizontal and vertical. And then the working team then translated these regulatory approaches into what we called ideal type model legislation. Now, the idea here, because we're already we're thinking it's three years on from the volume, what has been uh, achieved um, on the policy level? Well, I just wanted to, to take you back um, to um, a decision taken early on, in fact, before I joined the, the project team, to provide um, more choice to policymakers by uh, empowering them or enabling them to, in fact, conceivably pick uh, one of the models or to pick and choose between the implementation options, which we put in each ideal type model. Um, and this extends all the way, uh, um, taking into account issues of legal basis, this extends all the way to the choice of legal instrument, which each model would, would take. Um, the horizontal um, model, we have in a directive, and because of the um, binding nature of the decision to be taken, by Eurojust in the vertical model after consultation uh, procedure has failed between the member states, we have gone in the instrument and the volume for regulation. Um, so briefly, I wanted to um, get, I've been speaking for the past two minutes about the implementation options and I have been doing so because I think it's important to keep in mind that the, the fully fledged models are ideal types. Uh, policymakers are free to take aspects from each model and and um, and play with those models until they fit something which um, which appeals to them and which is politically feasible. Um, the main implementation options under the horizontal model um, come back to the objectives of the model. Will should the horizontal model um, restrict itself to it, trying to ensure against nebis and idem situations, or should it go further towards um, improving the, um, the best, uh, improving the procedure uh, to look for the best forum overall and go and lean towards, if you like, the allocation model, which Andre has just uh, set out for you. On top of the objectives of the horizontal model, um, we also looked at the options for the concept of conflict. Would we um, include actual conflicts of jurisdiction or extend also to potential conflicts of jurisdiction, which would clearly give even a horizontal model a more preventive uh, bent? In terms of the factors for, for deciding um, which, which the member states would be using, in the horizontal consultation procedures there, I don't want to stray too far into um, the, the, the following presentation, which I think we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, 
but the factors and the, and the transparency of the factors um, were, were options that were debated um, at length within the working team, uh, with uh, Eurojust and with, with other practitioners. Um, we had to look also at the formalization of the consultation procedure between member states with an eye to preventing and or resolving a conflict of jurisdiction. And by formalization, we mean uh, primarily um, in, the, in the instrument, what role suspects or victims should have in that procedure. Um, and, then, and then afterwards, um, responding to the decision uh, to be taken. Also, the content of consultation procedure is important. Would the, would the member states be getting together with a view to reaching a solution, full stop? Or would there be uh, an objective already, already on the table to concentrate proceedings? In terms of the parties to the consultation procedure, the issue which arises immediately is in a horizontal model, um, what role should there be for Eurojust? Um, in terms of the outcome, and there's only a few more on this list, so don't worry. Uh, in terms of the outcome of the consultation procedure, um, how binding would this would the would, it, would the opinion be? What would be in the um, in the uh, decision eventually reached by the member states? And lastly, what would the options for judicial review of that decision uh, be in the end? Now, that was the longest list of this of this brief talk. I, I promise you. Um, for the vertical model, all of the above in certain ways do apply. All of these implementation options are there because the horizontal model sits underneath the vertical imposition of a, of a, a binding decision by Eurojust in, in the event that the horizontal model fails. So all of the above applied to the working team, plus what exactly should the inter involvement of Eurojust look like? What would the outcome of Eurojust intervention B, how binding, and what would be the options for judicial review? At that point, we get rather technical for a 10 minute or 15 minute uh, talk. So I'll keep going. And uh, if you forgive me, just to, I was looking for a way to, to condense the, the, uh, the model actually chosen. Although I think it was important to set out the, the building blocks we considered. If you forgive me, I couldn't find a, a better way to condense it than we have in the ELI instrument. So I will just do, uh, read a little bit from the ELI instrument. In the proposed legislative horizontal model, uh, we decided to put in the aim of the horizontal instrument to be not only to prevent Nabisanidan violations, but also to ensure a non-arbitrary choice of forum. So extending beyond NBII, it covers both actual and potential conflicts. It addresses both parallel and multiple proceedings. It refers to the amended Eurojust guidelines as guidance for the assessment of the specific circumstances of the individual case. Sorry for the long sentence. Uh, again, once more, I don't want to stray into the next uh, presentation. It provides for a limited involvement of the suspect and the victim in the consultation procedure. And perhaps the one that encapsulates the, the model the best, it, it obligates the national authorities to conclude a formal agreement on the solution of the conflict delineating the circumstances and the factors considered, whereby preference should be given to the concentration of proceedings whenever possible. So fairly strong, um, fairly strong um, foundations for the consultation procedure there. Uh, lastly, it clarifies the need for judicial review of the formal agreement for the national judge and provides some rules for the transfer of proceedings and of evidence. Um, in the before I come on to, to end with the, the added value that we see in a nutshell, which I'll attempt to put in a nutshell, of the horizontal model and the vertical model, um, a little uh, bit on the, on the proposed legislative instrument um, in the vertical model. It aims in the same way at preventing the beast needing violations and ensuring a non-arbitrary choice of forum. It maintains, as I've already said, the horizontal basis before the, the supranational decision comes in. Uh, it empowers each of the involved authorities and or, important, and importantly, or the suspect with the power to trigger the decision of Eurojust when national authorities have failed to reach consensus in the horizontal phase. And the, the actual decision to be taken by 
uh, Eurojust, um, we have inserted a procedure, uh, a specialized structure within Eurojust uh, for the taking of that decision. Um, it also adapts the Eurojust guidelines in the same manner as the horizontal suspect, grants the victim and the suspect and the victims the right to submit their views by means of a written opinion before Eurojust adopts its decision. It provides for the judicial review of your just decision before the Court of Justice. So the national law for horizontal, Court of Justice for the vertical model. Um, and then I won't see the last point because I don't, it's um, not so important right now. Um, to come to the added value of the horizontal model and the vertical model, these are very much reflected in the building blocks, which I've, I've just actually enumerated for you. But to summarize, um, I would venture, and Andre will certainly uh, keep me right here, um, that um, the horizontal model aims to further, in inverted commas, further ensure against uh, Nebis and Edom situations by improving the, the consistency and legal certainty around uh, this type of consultation. It goes beyond Nebis and Edom, as I've stressed once or twice already, toward an objective of, of limiting and potentially eliminating non-arbitrary choices of forum. And ideally, the forum chosen should be the best one. Um, as I've already stated, it, if we get into the details, perhaps the most striking in the horizontal model are that although the member states remain in the box seat, the procedure for their consultations and the factors upon which they will consult and decide are to be defined by EU law in our, in our model, in a directive. Um, for the vertical model, everything I've just said does apply, perhaps with, with a different um, with a different color, a different emphasis, but plus, of course, the added value would be um, the empowerment of Eurojust to take a binding supranational uh, decision. Now, um, I think that opens quite a few Pandora's boxes already. So I will just close by saying that um, it was a pleasure to, to revisit this project, which I was involved in um, until 2018. And in doing so, I, I, I managed to uh, soak up the, the report on Eurojust casework in the field of prevention and resolution of conflicts of jurisdiction updated in 2018. There's no month on that, and I don't have the month, but it came out around the same time as our volume was, was coming to the shelves. Um, and I, I believe that a new document will, will be coming soon on that. And it's really fascinating to see how evolving crime trends uh, are, are bringing up um, the issue of, of parallel proceedings. Um, and Euro, to, see, to see Eurojust's stance on this, where parallel proceedings may actually be triggered by Eurojust. Um, very, very interesting. Um, to see, and it's it's great, I, I believe, to continue sharing expertise between academic research and, and practice, and uh, through this path, we should be able to nourish policy and, and um, activities of the EU uh, legislature. So apologies for the weakening voice. It's, it's actually very, um, quite strong hay fever, but hopefully I gave you a, a, a decent overview of the horizontal and vertical models, and I look forward to any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for uh, <clears throat> the voice holding out so well, and your very interesting summary, and your epitome of the work of the European Law Institute, which is to bring academics, practitioners in the form of judges and, um, and, all, and advocates together to try and improve the law across Europe. Now, before I turn to our last speaker, uh, may I say that the, uh, 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 as has been indicated in the publicity, we are, we'll have a short question answer session. I see one question has emerged already, and I very much hope there will be more to deal with what is a very fascinating and difficult subject. And now we're going to turn really from the academic uh, to the practical, uh, I <clears throat> and uh, we, it's a very great pleasure to introduce Teresa Magno, uh, 
she is uh, a member of Eurojust. She is the assistant to the national member for Italy and joined Eurojust in February 2018. And she is vice chair of the cyber uh, crime team there. Before coming to Eurojust, she was a judge in, in Italy, both a criminal trial judge and an investigatory judge in Masala and Medina, and has taken a great interest in teaching judges, but also in building European cooperation in uh, criminal matters, which has become, as the years go by, ever more important. So we look forward uh, to your ex bringing us up to date from a practical uh, viewpoint, but also to your comments upon the proposals set out in the Ely uh, draft instrument. Teresa Manu. Many thanks for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I would like to congratulate, congratulate the Institute for this very ambitious, relevant proposal and congratulate also the previous speakers for their presentations. They are really uh, thought provoking uh, for me. Um, as Lord Thomas said, I'm a practitioner, but I also like studying law. And what lies behind the interpretation of law is studying it. So um, what we do at Eurojust takes into account this um, approach, meaning that when, at, uh, when I work at Eurojust, uh, when I deal with conflict of jurisdictions, which is something that we face every day, really every day, we have to consider uh, our um, legal framework. So my um, intervention uh, is a little bit more traditional and it, take, uh, it takes into account um, as we are uh, the, 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 um, the status quo. So uh, the uh, legal framework as it is in order to show you what kind of margin of maneuver we have. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I'm also tempted to react to what uh, to all the interesting uh, inputs that have been provided by Professor Kripp and by Gavin Robinson, but I will try to resist uh, so that at least I can um, go on with this presentation, which, as I said, is a little bit mm, theoretical, but it mirrors what we have to consider in our daily work. We can't do without it. That, that's why, um, yeah, uh, we start with, yeah, let's see whether I can go on with this uh, presentation. Let's see. I can't change, uh, let's see. The, uh, yeah, it doesn't go. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, I will start with some considerations regarding how we uh, can uh, resolve jurisdiction conflicts by underlining um, a few um, uh, considerations, meaning uh, there are no binding instruments establishing a mechanism to resolve conflicts of jurisdiction in criminal matters in the EU. As also Professor Clip underlined, uh, there is no uh, prohibition against concurrent jurisdiction under international law. And I'm sure you know that also Article 4 of Protocol 7 to the um, European Commission of Human Rights prohi um, uh, prohibits consecutive proceedings, but not concurrent proceedings. So um, having said that, uh, I have to go on. Yes, um, I would like uh, you, as I said, to forgive me for recalling um, quite old initiatives at the level of the European communities regarding the need to provide for procedural mechanisms to prevent parallel criminal proceedings. But I think that that's really necessary because I want to underline you the um, huge complexities, the challenges that uh, these issues uh, involve, the issues that we face every day um, at Eurojust, and also the issues that judicial authorities face every day, because it's our colleagues who call uh, us, who come to us, and uh, it's our colleagues that we advise according to the current legal framework. So, mm, uh, we have uh, to take into account, yes, the, uh, the need uh, to consider uh, 
a few um, established principles. Um, and Professor Clip uh, already pointed out that the principle of territoriality. So there is no need for me to uh, talk about it, but I would like also to um, underline that there are other um, principles we have to take into account, and they are the principle of extraterritorial jurisdiction. One, uh, one of them is the principle of personality, which concerns the nationality either of the perpetrator or of the victim. Another uh, principle we have to take into account um, is uh, the universality principle mm, that concerns crimes against humanity, but for example, uh, as far as I know, a sort of principle of universality is also contained in uh, foreseen in German law regarding jurisdiction uh, on certain types of uh, cyber crimes. And then the protective principle that concerns acts endangering the sovereignty or national interest of the state. So um, this um, uh, is something that I would like to underline because it gives you uh, an idea of where the complexity comes from. And, and I come from a jurisdiction where um, the very notion of offense committed in the state, which is Article 6 of the Italian Criminal Code, has been broadened um, to include even just a fragment of the criminal process, uh, which uh, when considered in conjunction with subsequent acts committed abroad, uh, may constitute attempted offense or even a uh, complete offense. So this approach uh, practically has huge consequences, and it had also huge consequences on the executions of uh, European arrest warrants. The Italian law implementing the framework decision you know, contained um, grounds for refusal that were not in line with the um, framework decision, but reflected the approach um, of the uh, Italian criminal code to the principle of um, uh, uh, territoriality and jurisdiction. So now the, the Italian law implementing the framework decision has been uh, changed um, so that the, uh, it's more in line, I would say, with the um, European instrument. But um, this expansive view of jurisdiction taken by national legislators, legislators um, has long been accompanied in the international community by a tendency to uh, criminalize violations of common interest, uh, the prevention and repression of which require collective and cooperative efforts. Um, I would like to mention the thematic conventions that have been drawn in the main global and regional international fora, such as the UN, the Council of Europe, also the European Union, that are in line with this approach, and Professor Clip made reference to it. Um, this approach is based on a scheme of um, on the scheme of identifying, I would say, on one hand, the uh, types of uh, offenses in respect to which the states are obliged to consider such as, as offenses, and on the other hand, uh, extending their punishment within the international community. Um, the criteria for attributing jurisdiction are alternative to the classic principle of territoriality. And for example, they refer to the principle of defense or the principle of personality in order to make up for jurisdictions that are unable or reluctant to exercise their punitive claim. And at EU level, there are several examples, but obviously I can't go uh, uh, into details. Um, so, um, one of the main circumstances that has contributed to exacerbating the uh, problem of overlapping jurisdictions is, um, without doubt, the um, progressive transformation of crime, uh, which has taken a decidedly transnational character. Um, on top of it comes cybercrime, I would say. Uh, cybercrime per se is not anchored uh, to territory. So the jurisdictional challenge is huge for the investigations and prosecutions of cybercrime. 
um, easily you can have uh, a positive conflict of jurisdiction, meaning that two or more states claim jurisdiction the same uh, facts or, uh, or acts, or negative conflict maybe as well. So um, I would like also to underline that even the Cybercrime Convention refers to the territoriality principle for establishing jurisdiction. And um, this principle is contained in the EU measure taken for combating racism online, for example, and computer integrity offenses. Uh, this entails that um, there is always a state competent to prosecute. Uh, of course, in this way, uh, negative conflicts are addressed because there is always a state who's competent to prosecute. But on the other end, I would say that this doesn't help with positive conflicts of jurisdiction. So um, in cybercrime cases, more than one state is able to claim jurisdiction based on the territoriality principle. That's what we are seeing. Um, it has to be added, though, that the primacy of mm, territorial principle does not entail that states can't refer to extraterritorial principle to justify the exercise of jurisdiction. Um, that's foreseen in Article 22 of the Budapest Cybercrime Convention that in addition refers to the active personality principle that this to say that the state can exercise jurisdiction um, if the offense is committed by his nationals, if the, if the offense is punishable under the criminal law where it was committed, or if the offense is committed outside the territorial jurisdiction of any state. So uh, to sum up, um, the territoriality principle um, does not uh, solve the problem of positive jurisdictional conflicts since it's not um, the only principle recognized for establishing jurisdiction, and um, it allows more than one state to claim or exercise jurisdiction. Um, that's even more problematic where law differs, meaning that it's not rare uh, the situation where a sentence conduct is allowed under the jurisdiction under the jurisdiction A, but is punished under jurisdiction B. So um, it's clear that this results in a certainty um, to which law has to be respected. Um, so for example, the publication of certain contacts may be illegal in state A, but that um, because state A has stricter rules, but it's um, permitted in state, um, in state B. And uh, I, I think that the consequences for the principle of legality, for the principle of nullum crimen sine legge, I say it in the Italian way, I'm sorry, it's not English, um, are clear. So um, uh, criteria for balancing jurisdiction uh, do not exist, for example, in the uh, cybercrime convention I was making reference to. And this convention uh, states indeed that in case of conflict of jurisdiction, the involved parties shall consult with a view to determine the most appropriate jurisdiction for prosecution, but the convention does not spell out any factor that has to be taken into account when settling conflicts claims, com when settling uh, conflicting claims or conflicts, yes. Um, so nothing is said uh, on procedures or considerations for coordinating um, jurisdictional conflicts. Um, maybe it's also interesting for you to know that the Arab Convention on Combating Information Technology Offenses contains um, some criteria. Uh, well, actually, it's an order of priority for the exercise of jurisdiction. So the first criteria is the one of states whose security or interests were affected by offense. The second, uh, the state on whose territory um, the, um, the offense was committed. And the third is the state for which the uh, wanted person is um, a national. Just out of curiosity, I mentioned this. Um, so um, coming now to the, um, briefly, to the available instruments in the EU. So the, um, the it is clear that uh, one of the, <laughs> I would say the main instrument is the framework decision I mentioned, but uh, also Eurojust. Now we come to the role of Eurojust that has been mentioned so many times during the previous interventions. Okay, so um, uh, I have to uh, immediately refer 
uh, to the regulations uh, of 2018 uh, that established, let's say, the new legal statute of neurojust. Um, I would like to remark that there is a provision you might want to consider um, uh, even when proposing uh, legislation. Uh, that is Article 4, Paragraph 4 of the uh, Eurojust Regulation. Uh, this provision says, uh, says that um, where two or more member states can't agree um, as to which of them should undertake an investigation or prosecution um, following um, a request, uh, Eurojust shall issue, shall issue a written opinion on the case, and um, this opinion uh, shall be sent to the member states concerned immediately. So this uh, um, opinion uh, is um, issued by Eurojust. Uh, I would say uh, that uh, Eurojust, I would like to underline that Eurojust is competent only for specific uh, categories of crimes. And um, uh, at the same time, I also would like to, to uh, underline that the competent authorities of the member states uh, concerned shall respond uh, to the written opinions without a new delay, and um, the um, the this opinion is mm, I wouldn't define it binding because the competent authorities of the member states may refuse to follow the written opinion of, Euro, of Eurojust if and this this important to underline doing so um, would harm essential national security interests, but also if this would jeopardize the success of an ongoing investigation or would jeopardize the safety of an individual. So this provision, um, uh, I would say as a content, which is um, uh, quite different from the um, uh, role of Eurojust that was proposed in the um, previous interventions, so uh, the, um, even the uh, more proactive role of Eurojust um, has to take into account these uh, limitations, meaning that the, mm, the uh, opinion of Eurojust, as far as the status quo is concerned, bears uh, weight, but it's not binding. There are, um, the, the, the member states can refuse to follow it, uh, they have to provide reasons for it, but it's possible when the conditions of, um, of uh, Article 4, Paragraph 4 of the regulation are met. So um, um, the, uh, the, the regulation uh, does not provide for uh, at least the, the current uh, regulation, the current statute of Eurojust for um, a very proactive role uh, to the extent that was um, speakable, it was proposed by the previous speakers. So um, coming now to what we uh, in practice do, I would like to underline that Eurojust is very effective in what it does. I'm not saying this because I, I work in the Italian desk at Eurojust, but because I'm, uh, I really see it. So um, from an objective point of view, also observers can, uh, can say it. Uh, since um, we uh, manage uh, to, um, to advise and uh, to, to lead our colleagues to, to find uh, solutions in very difficult cases. As Professor Clip said, all the trafficking cases are multi, um, uh, multi cases, and there are so many uh, issues involved, so many factors we have to take into account, so many uh, challenges and hurdles we have to consider. That's um, yeah, what, what we, uh, we do in practice is using this, um, this criteria that have been updated in 2016 by Eurojust that um, are um, in the guidelines for deciding which jurisdiction should prosecute. That's what we do. Um, and I know that there is no priority in those, um, in those criteria. I perfectly know that that might lead to um, yeah, um, uh, uncertainty uh, on, uh, from the side of the, um, the defendants uh, because uh, it's a decision on the jurisdiction that might be triggered on the basis of this, um, this criteria. But um, um, I would also say that it is quite difficult to combine flexibility and from one side um, with uh, security and also with uh, rights. But this is the balance. We have to strive 
to achieve as, um, as much as possible. And I, um, I would also like to uh, point out, to, to close this, this intervention, that um, at Eurojust, we try to consider uh, the importance of rights, meaning that any kind, any time, any kind with advice on how to, um, to get to a certain decision on conflicts of jurisdictions, what we have to consider are the um, uh, rights of the people involved, meaning rights of the defendants and rights of the victims. This is our legal. Uh, standard. We are judges and prosecutors, and we, uh, in the given situation, do our best to consult this very conflicting uh, instances, issues, interests, rights that uh, are at stake. So I hope that I have uh, provided you some um, uh, useful reaction on um, your comments, but uh, if there is something that uh, you want uh, me to address more in detail, um, I'm available, I'm here. Thank well, you. Well, thank you very, very much indeed. We have, um, that was very interesting and very interesting to hear the, <clears throat> the perspective of someone who is in this day-to-day -day on a practical and practicing level. Now, we have some questions uh, and I think I'm going to pose um, then I shall select the person I'm going to ask, and I'm going to ask uh, again, Professor Gavin Robinson the, the first um, question, and that is because it relates to what he was talking about, and I was going to ask Professor Clip about the question on the UK EU trade cooperation. I'll come back to that in a minute, and we'll pick up one with uh, um, Teresa Manio in a second, but can I ask the first question that's asked is this, what would happen if after the consultation period in the horizontal model, the formal agreement mentioned would not be reached? Would you be able to answer that question? I hope so. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Bachmeier. Nice to hear from you again. Um, well, there, there was the. This was lengthily discussed, I believe, uh, early on, um, in the elaboration of the horizontal model, and you can see this in the Eli instrument, where we speak of, speak about three different options for the. Um, let's say, if you to cut straight to the question, um, the failure to reach uh, an agreement would would have consequences. That's what we have in the Eli instrument. In the model that we propose, uh, one looks in vain for such consequences because it was decided uh, that to represent the less intensive uh, ideal type horizontal model uh, this would um, this would uh, not be uh, appropriate and um, if let's say that this i believe um, show, shows the the real the added value of the of the vertical model because in the vertical model uh, if the horizontal consultations fail, you, the Eurojust procedure is triggered. Uh, in the horizontal model, um, there are no strict consequences. But I would just like to say, without trying to summarize the whole the whole model, that um, the the entire instrument is is um, is designed to to trammel uh, the the member states towards reaching agreement. So we hope that. Um, all of the all of the elaborations we've we've gone into would would boost the chance of there being uh, agreement reached. Well, thank you very much indeed for for um, that very concise answer. And can I turn to the second question, which is from Martin Burrs? Um, if formal agreement is reached, will it be subject to judicial review? If yes, which court shall be competent? the court of the state taking over the prosecution or the court of the state transferring proceedings to the other state. I'm going to, yeah. um, I think it's fairest that I ask you to answer that question. I'm gonna, I've am i got a question I want to ask uh, uh, <clears throat> Teresa Manu in a moment, but thank you. So should I answer? I yes. think it's pretty okay. easy. Yes. Uh, they're, they're connected in a sense as well. Well, um, I have the instrument with me, and um, the answer is that it would be left to national law um, in a nutshell. And in our explanatory um, um, memorandum, uh, we, we leave it open in a sense, saying that this would, it would be possible to, to challenge um, the decision um, 
under each member state. So I, would, I, can, I can read from the explanatory note, um, any agreement concluded pursuant to the relevant provision is without prejudice to legal remedies under national law to request judicial review on the choice of forum. Now the explanatory note, I won't read all of it, but the last sentence is, this does not preclude the possibility to challenge a decision in the courts of each of the member states concerned. Thank you again very much for that very concise answer. Uh, can I ask you, uh, uh, Andre, and possibly a, a slightly left field question, which is from Tim O'Sullivan, which reads, under the EU uh, UK trade cooperation agreement, if a member state has a forum bar on extradition of its own nationals, the UK may request that it should exercise extraterritoriality to try an offence committed in the UK. Should the ENI draft guidelines establish common criteria for a member state to apply in exercising this discretion? And or should Eurojust be empowered to make a, a binding decision? A slightly political question, but uh, and a very interesting one if we were to make progress in, the, in what is obviously going to be a difficult issue. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tim O'Sullivan, for that intriguing question. Um, uh, and I cannot evade the political dimension of it. Uh, what we did uh, 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 within EDI is, a, uh, is, is preparing a draft legislative proposal uh, uh, that is uh, uh, aimed at, at uh, adoption at the, within the European Union. Uh, 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 and uh, especially the first model, the, the allocation model, uh, uh, allocates jurisdiction within the area of freedom, security, and justice. Um, as we all know, the United Kingdom is no longer a member of that European Union. So in that context, it is not a, 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 a legal instrument that would incorporate uh, uh, the United Kingdom. At the same time, the principles and the, the ideal types that we have developed uh, would be equally uh, 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 put, uh, uh, applicable in a bilateral contact uh, uh, a contract between the, the Un Un European Union and a third state like the United Kingdom. Um, so that would be possible in the current agreement within the, with, between the United Kingdom and uh, the European Union, uh, jurisdiction matters are not mentioned at all. Uh, uh, it is limited to a selection, uh, a kind of cherry picking of the most important forms of cooperation, uh, copies, paste, uh, 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 legal instruments from the European arrest warrant, uh, and a couple of other major uh, uh, legal instruments. Having said that, uh, the very fact that uh, uh, our models um, take the territoriality principle as it's a, a main and dominant uh, 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 legal principle offers wide opportunities to cooperate with the United Kingdom as well. To a certain extent, one could say uh, the territoriality principle is a principle invented, uh, invented by common law. And it has been for many, many centuries, the one and only principle uh, uh, in, uh, applicable under common law. Only more recently, the, the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon countries have adopted uh, uh, other principles. Teresa Magno referred to the fact that in many cases, it is exactly this territoriality principle that creates problems, not because of the old fashioned cases that I, I mentioned uh, in my example, the theft uh, uh, of taking a, an object away, the killing of an individual on the street, there, the locus delicti, the place of the offence, is very easy to determine. But states have been very creative in extending their concept of territoriality. Uh, so they may say the very fact that your boat carrying drugs is sailing towards our shores is already uh, 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 affecting our territory and therefore our territory applies. <coughs> the only solution to that would be to give a common definition of what a locus delicti is. Uh, 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 this is where 
uh, our proposal stops, but could uh, continue in a next project. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for that very fascinating um, answer to uh, an intriguing problem. And I wanted to ask, uh, if I might, Theresa, and your first one of the questions asked, and then a follow up question. Um, because there's a question from uh, Peter Schneiderhahn, which asks When does jurisdiction, a conflict of jurisdiction, start? The notice of the crime by the victim to the police, when the prosecution service takes over, or when a court is getting involved? And I think what it's directed at is when does Eurojust get involved? At which of those stages? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I have to be uh, provide you with a short answer, which is a little bit challenging. Anyway, um, so what we advise based on our experience uh, that we uh, um, are informed as soon as possible of possible conflict of, of jurisdiction, meaning uh, we ask our colleagues to uh, inform us uh, of uh, the uh, investigations uh, they are carrying out. And sometimes the investigation per se has um, transnational elements uh, and this is enough for us to step in and reach out for, for example, to the um, member states desk where they think uh, of the state where we think that there are uh, links with the national investigations, so that we can um, allow our co our colleagues to get uh, to consult and get and get in touch. So sometimes even the, um, the, 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 the report filed by a victim might uh, be sufficient. Um, we, we, uh, why do we ask our colleagues to, to do this, uh, to inform us as soon as possible? Because we want to detect uh, this conflicts of, uh, this possible conflicts of jurisdiction at the earliest possible stage. Uh, why is it? It's because we um, actually, I, I do believe in the respect of rights. So uh, I, uh, we want to uh, prevent uh, people's rights being infringed. We want to prevent resources from being dispersed. We, we, um, we want to um, have our colleagues uh, work uh, in cases where, uh, let's say, uh, it's, uh, mm, rights are not violated and where it's um, the, the coordination can be uh, carried out in the most effective, uh, efficient possible way. These are not words. These are, these are cases, these are uh, investigations, and this is people's life. And, um, th this is why we are so committed uh, in dealing and solving and mm, also preventing uh, of jurisdiction. So mm, as far as the prevention is concerned, we do it in a practical way, uh, but I would say that maybe uh, a legal instrument might help a lot. So what we do is based on our experience, on the criteria, on um, the um, yeah, on the, uh, also uh, on the evaluations of the consequences of the applications of the uh, factors that are considered in the guidelines. But also a legal framework, I would say, being a judge, a criminal judge, uh, I have to admit that might help. It it might help us. The defendants and the victim, but uh, um, I am aware that it's not easy to to introduce to to agree even to negotiate such a piece of, of um, EU legislation. So we'll see. I hope that I have answered this question. Oh, you've answered it perfectly. And we've got one final question, which I was going to ask uh, Andre Clip to answer. It's from uh, Mustafa Abide, and it says, "Is it possible to think of a new principle?" that is linking submission to a particular judicial system and the ability of residents in the region associated with the system. And he gives an example of being subject to a European judicial system in general allows the continuing enjoyment of residents in all countries of the European, while being subject to a judicial system in a country X allows residents in country X only. Well, thank you very much for that uh, uh, that 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 question. Um, that, I, I think the, the the answer to to, to that is, is is twofold. 
on the one hand, states do already have a principle called uh, a, a domicile principle based on the very fact that an individual is a resident uh, uh, in a specific state that would uh, uh, allow that specific state to have jurisdiction over that uh, uh, individual when committing crimes wherever uh, uh, he goes. Uh, when it comes to the European, European judicial uh, area, it is very interesting to see that despite the fact that the Treaty on the European Union has created a single European area, uh, it has left uh, uh, the member states' jurisdiction intact, completely intact, uh, uh, when it comes to jurisdictional matters. Uh, and here is, I think, where the problem is. Uh, Article 82 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union gives the European Union the mandate, or one could even say the task uh, and the obligation to prevent and solve conflicts of jurisdiction. However, no attempt yet has been made, uh, despite the good efforts of uh, Eurius in the given situation. Uh, uh, our, our proposals do not affect that. Uh, uh, just does what it can, but we think more can be done. Uh, uh, once again, the allocation model strives for prevention, whereas the vertical model and the horizontal model strives for solution of the problem. And that is, in, uh, uh, I think, is the way uh, uh, forward uh, and to, at a certain moment, to step out of the uh, status quo in order to prevent situations uh, uh, as are applicable, as are visible in the many cases that came to the Court of Justice on Nabis in Eden, where concurrent prosecu uh, prosecutions took place to the extent, as the famous case of Mr. M, uh, who was uh, 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 convicted one week, uh, 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 in, uh, convicted in Belgium one week before the proceedings started in Italy. These are the situations that we should prevent. Thank you. And I just want to ask one final question. And it really is susceptible to a very short answer from Teresa and Mario. Uh, and it's this, there are lots of factors which worry people about um, juris going to another jurisdiction, penalties, worry about the process, the rights of defendant, and states of various interests. What in your view is the biggest single factor that prevents um, an agreement of the kind that's been put forward by uh, Ely uh, to solve the problem in a pragmatic way. What is it that's the problem? To be honest with you, I don't see uh, that many problems provided that um, the reasoning for the decision is provided and remedies are provided. Uh, what um, I would like to underline is, uh, is that um, uh, defendants and victims, uh, I think, uh, this is the jure condendo, I would say, um, should be entitled uh, to uh, get access to the reasoning, to the grounds that have been evaluated for coming to a certain decision, and eventually for um, challenging uh, this decision. And uh, I, um, while reading the uh, Institute um, proposal of, uh, of regulation, I was really um, interested in reading the provision that says that the suspects and the defendants may have a saying in this procedure, meaning that they are notified. So it, it's a way to get um, defendants and, and victims involved. We'll see what the, um, the future will bring us. So I hope that I have answered your question. You have answered it perfectly, uh, uh, Teresa. And thank you very much. It remains for me uh, to thank uh, on everyone's behalf uh, the, the three speakers for excellent presentations, um, the, the practical and the uh, idealistic, tinged with the practical of trying to get something agreed in this very, very important and an increasingly uh, relevant area. Um, I'd also like very much to thank on behalf of the Secretariat at Ely for putting this all together, making certain it's run correctly, 
technical worries can ruin these things, and but this has gone very well indeed. But I also would like to say that I do think that uh, the talks tonight and the work on the project with Andre Clepp and Gowan Robinson have, uh, have undertaken show really what it is trying to do. It's to tackle real problems. And it's clear from what Teresa Mania has told us that this is a, a real problem that, that uh, although being successfully addressed in by Eurojust needs uh, <coughs> to be tightened up. And it also brings together the academic world and the practical world. And that was the real ambition when Ely was founded in, in, in 2011. And this has been therefore a particularly appropriate way of celebrating uh, in the aspect of criminal law, uh, this, this uh, achievement. Thank you all very, very much indeed uh, on behalf of the European Law Institute uh, and on behalf of those who participate in the seminar for a most interesting evening. Thank you very, very much indeed.